So it's my pleasure to pass it off to Bob and Monica Leverett. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We're really excited to uh, hear from you and see all your beautiful friends of the forest. Thank you, Sophie. I guess our, well, we'll see. You're controlling the screen, I assume, what people see. Um, I asked Sophie if I could introduce us. I'm Monica and this is Bob, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you had the chance to read the Smithsonian Magazine article about Bob, you have the best possible introduction you could have to him. And I, I think Sophie sent it out to all of you. Bob Leverett is the co-discoverer of most of the known old growth in Massachusetts and also co-discoverer of lots of other places with old growth in the East. In 1990, in the 1990s, our friend, the environmental conservationist, John Davis dubbed Bob, quote, the East's leading old growth forest evangelist. <laughs> and when I met Bob, he was a little embarrassed about this designation, um, but I reminded him that his maternal grandfather was a circuit riding Baptist tent revivalist preacher with all of the fire and brimstone and everything else. And um, I finally said, honey, I'm sorry, but you've got the gene <laughs> and you folks will get to hear that soon. Uh, because he's an evangelist, he wound up organizing 10 old growth forest conferences in the East and he's now currently helping to organize one in New Hampshire this September with uh, many other people. Uh, now I wanna to switch to screen sharing. Um, okay. And share. And then we have to do slideshow. slideshow. Play from start. Okay, here we are. Um, these are uh, our credentials, mainly Bob's credentials, and you can read them at your leisure as I continue to talk. Um, Bob is trained as an engineer and uh, is nationally known as uh, an expert tree measurer. He, in fact, along with a couple of other people, figured out the with the new laser range finders, the best way to measure trees accurately. Uh, there were three people who figured this out independently, but only one of them was an evangelist. Mm -hmm. And so um, Bob has uh, been preaching about the sign method of tree measuring for many years now. And you can see American Forest Champion Tree Program is part of that thing. Uh, in more recent years, Bob has engaged in a lot of carbon research. This comes out of the measuring. He can measure a tree for volume. And once you know the volume of a tree, you know how much carbon it is uh, storing or sequestering, whatever. Um, and he's currently working with Shelby Perry of Northeastern Wilderness Trust. She is the- Conservation cons ecologist. Conservation ecologist. And she's doing uh, researching plots on the trust's lands and will be following them over time. And Bob will help her with, I think carbon analysis is the big thing. Okay, now there's me. Uh, my name, my professional name is Monica Yawkwich Leverett. I am in real life a, con a classical music concert pianist. And if you wanna Google my name, you can see my website and what I do there. But I also have uh, known Bob for 18 years and have been married to him for 17. 17 years, thank you. Um, and you pick up a lot of stuff when, when you spend that much time with someone. And I always love nature. He loves music and I love nature. So we make a good pair in that sense. Um, I also function as his editor uh, for whether he has to write something or present something or when he makes a paper or even a slideshow, we work together and uh, I have a, and I guess an editorial function is the best way to say it. Um, and I'm also his manager. Um, if people want to schedule a date or whatever, I sort of am the gatekeeper of all of that stuff. And can you explain why I have to be your manager? Well, 
basically, although I am 81 years old, I still require a lot of adult supervision. And Sweetie Pie here, Monica, uh, provides that. So she keeps me on track. Okay, so today we will look at great trees and forests of New England through a number of lenses, through science, history, aesthetic uh, issues, art, the spiritual and the role of forests in climate mit mitigation. And I now pass this on to Bob. Thank you very much, Monica. And thank you all for coming and we'll get right to what we're doing here. Uh, this is the first slide and I'm starting out in central Massachusetts. Uh, Monica and I are standing on the top of Mount Watetic, uh, a, a Monadnock, looking to the west toward that mountain you see in, in the distance and that's Wachusett Mountain. And that mountain has about 200, if not a little more acres of original growth forest, old growth forest. And Henry David Thoreau in 1842 walked from Concord all the way to, to the top of that mountain and observed from the top that Wachusett Mountain was the observatory for the whole state. I don't know whether Thoreau recognized the old growth forest that he walked through going up because it wasn't cathedral in, in form. And a lot of people probably thought that old growth forest was more redwood like and the trees on Wachusett are not that. Uh, also, a lot has changed. All the, the territory you see or the land that you see from where this photograph was taken across to Wachusett and up onto the mountain would have been basically fields in the middle 1800s. Farms, fields, the small settlements, the forest would have only been on wood, uh, the sides, uh, oftentimes the sides of the hills in what would have been woodlots. Uh, and for, for the most part, uh, people thought that all of the original forest was gone. Aha, but not so. We discovered in, uh, basically confirmed, that would be a better way of saying it, in about uh, 1995, that old growth had survived on Wachusett Mountain. There's a long story behind that, but I will go next and say simply that we found that there were trees up to 300, of almost one yellow birch now, almost 400 years old, as dated by my good friend, David Orwig from Harvard Forest. And that birch that you're looking at there, it's a yellow birch, Betula alleghaniensis was already 217 years old when Thoreau visited the mountain. Well, it's a boulder field. I actually broke my ankle up there in those rocks. And as a consequence, uh, you don't really walk through that. I had a group out part from the, the state uh, and was talking a mile a minute. And the next thing I knew I was on my back looking up with a broken ankle. It's that hard to get around on that mountain. Uh, but uh, with the ancient forest that was there, it was really a revelation. When you stand on the top of the mountain, you look north all the way and see uh, Mount Monadnock in uh, New Hampshire. You can look to the west and see Mount Greylock. And uh, these days you can look to the east and see the tall buildings of, of Boston right there. Well, moving on, but remembering this was central Massachusetts, moving on to the western side of the state, we found another area of a lot of old growth forest, Mohawk Trail and adjoining Savoy Mountain State Forest. And in this area, uh, there, uh, roughly half of the old growth we know of in the state is in this, uh, this region, Mohawk Trail and Savoy Mountain State Forest. And what you're looking at here, and I'll point to it, this is about a 230, 240 year old sugar maple. Uh, this is, one of the old yellow birches that don't know how old, but old growth. But you'll notice other trees in here, they're not old, all old, because one point to, to quickly learn about old growth is it's really a mixed age forest. There's a lot of old trees, but there are a lot of young trees. What is true about it is that it is managed by nature and it has been so managed by nature for millennia. 
And that's what we get out of it are the characteristics and the species that, that we see. Monica, do you have anything else to pass on on that? Well, I don't, you could talk about the oldest black birch. Uh, yes, yes. Another friend of mine, Tony D'Amato, he's the uh, director of the forestry program at the University of Vermont, actually did a study of all this old growth and he cored on this very mountain with a tree not looking a lot different from that one, a 332 year old yellow birch. He was 332 years old when he black cored birch. it in 2000, black birch in 2005. So it's about 350 years old now and one of the five or six oldest that we have ever dated anywhere. So that's how special this this place is. Now, Monica, maybe hey, one more thing. Uh, I'd love for you to tell them about the visit by the BBC oh, British Board Broadcast. Oh, yeah, we've done two specials. Uh, I was honored to take the BBC uh, there to this actual place. And when this photograph was taken, one of their their nature photographers, uh, Christian Nunez Donoso, uh, was uh, filming this for a special on the by the BBC, and he he goes all the way around the world filming great places. Uh, and I was a little worried that he'd not find anything special about this, so I uh, timidly asked. I said. Uh, well, uh, Christian, what do you think of this area here? And he said, Bob eats mystical. Christian is from uh, Chile. Chile. And I really felt relieved that others could see the magic of this wonderful place. Now, uh, anything to add to that, Monica? No. Okay, moving on. I want to make the point again that old growth is not just a collection of old trees but it's a centuries old, often millennia old natural ecological community controlled, formed by, managed by nature. And therefore you get trees of all ages. So right here is a, a relatively young yellow birch. This is a sugar maple, this is a sugar maple. There's a striped maple in here and you can see all kinds of ferns. Here's polypody fern, a lot of it. And, and so in this area of rocks and uh, trees, it, it's the processes that we are interested in that makes it old growth. And what's very important about it is that the community below ground is just as important. The life forms below ground are just as important as what's above ground. Monica, do you have something to add to that? Yes, um, I believe Sophie will be sending all of you Bob's list of old growth characteristics edited by me. Um, and you'll get that after the talk. I think it's very good. It has much more detail in it than we can take the time for in this talk. Next. Okay, moving on. What I like to do is, is give people a view of old growth up, up close and personal and also at a distance. I'm on a mountainside in Western Massachusetts, looking into the very place that, I, that the pre, previous photograph was taken somewhere right over in here. And this is Todd Mountain, and this is Clark Mountain over here. And all this is original forest, or most of it. Uh, anyway, uh, once you get above about 200 vertical, 300 vertical feet above the river, that's the Deerfield River running through there. And the point is that old growth at a distance, particularly where you're in a, a, rel a cove, it shows up quite well on Google Earth uh, in photographs as a heavily textured, uh, the canopy is heavily textured relative to younger forests. Here is a younger section, but that was probably blow down or whatever. And, and uh, we, we often, in the early days, would look at photographs or and and look at places where the land was very steep and simply go out and and find old growth in those places. Anyway, there's about um, probably a little more than 200 acres of old growth on this ridge, roughly the same as Wachusett Mountain. But the whole uh, area has about 600 acres. Anything more? Moving on. Now let's jump to another area, another area of old growth forest in Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts, 
in a place that highly unlikely right at Stockbridge, Mass., uh, a, a very upscale area visited by a lot of people and a lot of artists. And one place is called Ice Glen. And it's in fact very special because it's part of uh, uh, Joan Maloof, Dr. Joan Maloof, a good friend of ours, Old Growth Forest Network. Now we can see right in this picture, we, we're actually dedicating this as part of the Old Growth Forest Network. This is Joan herself. And this lady over here is Dr. Susan Messino, who is also very important in, in, in to the scene. And this, whoops, excuse no. me, folks. Uh, this, uh, this great tree right here is a white ash tree that I often show people to when we go there. And you can see the dimensions of it. But it would have been um, fairly common in the 1700s. Now, ash trees of this size and whatnot are rare and getting rare because of the emerald ash borer, but this tree has been treated. Now, one point I will, uh, uh, I'd like to point out is that this area was the tribal homeland of the Mohican nation. Monica, do you have anything to add? Two things. Um, the Mohicans are now working with the town of Stockbridge. They are in Ice Glen doing archeological research. And there's a wonderful museum in Stockbridge that they have created to show their history. It's, it's really worth a visit. The other thing I wanna say is the Old Growth Forest Network that was founded by Joan, Joan Maloof. Um, she had a dream many years ago at this point, 20 years ago, exactly, that there should be a forest, an old, preferably an old growth forest preserved, open to the public, and preserved in every county in the United States that can grow trees, which is about two thirds of the counties in the United States. And many of the forests that you will see in this slideshow are part of her network. Uh, we might mention it again, um, because they're real old growth. Not every county has real old growth. So the idea is to uh, preserve woods as forever wild so that they might become old growth in a century or two or three. Um, and so that's her vision. Um, and uh, she's, it's an organization well worth supporting. Okay, all right, we'll move on. Oh, by the way, what you're looking at there, despite the size of that ash tree, that's actually regrowth or second growth. The trees are somewhere between 120 and about 170 years old. Uh, the old growth in Ice Glen looks more like that. And here we see uh, a big rock formation. And what made it Ice Glen was that there's a lot of crevices between these rocks and deep enough that it held ice in colonial times. And the, the local citizens would come uh, all the way in, as, as late as June and sometimes July and harvest the ice in the crevices of, of these rocks. So it became Ice Glen. Here you can see what constitutes the, the vegetative makeup. Here's a, a, a hemlock. Here's a, an old black birch, another hemlock, a northern red oak. This is a white pine. Polypody fern covers uh, the rocks. And tell and, them this. And in general, when you see uh, th this is a little hemlock that's perched out on, on a flange of that rock, it's a very complex environment. And, and old growth forests are, are uh, ecological areas rich in niches. That is an example. And Anything else, Monica? Yeah, this is uh, one of the most magical places that you can visit, is all I want to say. Uh, it, especially if you can find a way to get there when there aren't a lot of tourists, um, in, which in the summer, uh, but it's, it's just, it's primeval. And, and by, and by, yeah, I'm sorry. And, and by the way, the Icy Glen, it was this place that was written about by Herman Melville in, in his, his book about the, the whale. Moby Dick. Moby Dick. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Senior moment. <laughs> Okay, moving on to places that are old growth or very close to it and also very cultural. This is the Bryant Woods in Central Massachusetts. And the Bryant Woods uh, is the homestead of one William Cullen Bryant. 
who was a towering figure in the 1800s. Uh, Bryant Park in New York City is named after him. He was the editor of the New York Post. He was the poet laureate of the United States for a period of time. And he came from this area and he thought he, he always thought he had virgin forest on his land. And by golly, he was right. He had some. Now what you're looking at here are, is not part of that virgin forest, but a forest that was very junior when he died. These are gargantuan white pines. This is a, an Eastern hemlock here, but these gargantuan white pines were seedlings when he passed away. Monica, anything else? Uh, I just want to use this opportunity to make a plug for donating to both Northeast Wilderness Trust and or our Forever Wild Fund at Kestrel because Bryant saved this land. It was nothing. It didn't look like a thing when, when he, after he died. And this is what happened with, it's an extraordinary forest. What, so, what she means is the, the white pines had grown back, the ones that were seedlings then. Right. Moving on, now this is, these two scenes are both out of Bryant Wood. The one on the left is old growth. I, for, uh, for the trustees, I've dated a lot of these hemlocks in here. And most of these, this, these in here are approaching now about, they're approaching 300 years in age. Maybe not quite that, others are. Uh, on, but this is what Bryant recognized as, virgin forest, that's what he would have called it then. Over here is that white pine area of the gargantuan white pines that I spoke of. And this is the part that grew back as the second. Well, then a lot of people think this is old growth. It isn't, but the size of the pines certainly make them think that. Anything else, Monica? Just to say, uh, these pictures actually look fairly similar uh, at this distance. Um, those who, like Bob, who can look at the bark of a tree and have a pretty good idea of its age, if they looked closely, could tell that, that these were younger than these. Uh, the other thing that makes this old growth is what's underground, which you can't see. Okay, moving on. Now, jumping from our quick survey of some old growth areas, let's look at individual trees. Uh, a, lot, there, a lot of people say you can't see the forest for the trees, well, I like to turn that around sometimes and say a lot of people look at the forest, but they don't see the trees. You can't miss this one. This is probably the largest tree, single tree in New England, and it's called the Pinchot sycamore, American sycamore. Um, and we see here my good buddy in, in co-tree measure, uh, Jared Lockwood, uh, standing next to the tree. It's uh, huge. It's 28.6 feet in circumference at breast height. Mm -hmm. That happens uh, automatically. I'm not doing that. Uh, it's got about 140 foot average crown spread. It's right about 100 feet in height. This is really a monumentally mm -hmm. large tree. We don't know how old it is. It might be 300 years, but it was named for the father of the U.S. Forest Service, Gifford Pinchot, who was from Simsbury, Connecticut. Monica? And I'd like to add, our host, Sophie Veltrip, grew up in Simsbury, Connecticut, and also was a great friend of this tree. So moving on. Now, <clears throat> great trees are where you find them. This was out in a cornfield in, at the edge of the Taconics in eastern New York, and that's the champion New York State sycamore. It in the and the Pinchot are almost identical in points. This tree might outpoint the Pinchot by one or two, but this is the state champion sycamore of New York State. And one of Monica's favorite trees. Monica, do you have anything to add to that? Well, what I like about it is that it is in the most beautiful setting that I know of of the large sycamores that I've seen. It's in a cornfield, there are distant mountains, it has every bit of room to spread in every direction. And, it's and it has. <laughs> and it has, and it's gorgeous. Well, you see there uh, that, by the way, CBH means circumference at breast height. And you can see we keep the, uh, the numbers or the measurements for the state of New York on that particular tree. We will go out periodically and remeasure it. Moving on, 
from uh, this appears to be all about sycamores. There's another one, but this one is really, really special, folks. This is the famous Pecumtuck buttonwood. Buttonwood is a sycamore in the old in Old Deerfield, Massachusetts, thought to be over 400 years old. This tree was a witness to the Deerfield massacre in 1704. Uh, it was written about by historian George Sheldon in terms of all of the things that had gone by and seen, had been seen by, or this tree was alive during that period of time. And by 1934, it was really ailing. And they brought in a famous tree surgeon that carved out decay. And I, I think he actually filled in the decay with cement. That's not any longer done. But lo and behold, the tree actually healed over. You can't even see where that wound was. The, the, the buttonwood is pretty large. You can see the numbers here. It's not quite as large as the ones on the, the past two slides, but large enough. Of course, Monica is standing next to the tree for scale, Monica. So I'll say two things. Um, the place that was doctored by the tree surgeon is on the other side of the tree. So you can't see it in this picture. Um, and the other uh, witness story, this tree has been a witness it's on the front lawn of the administrative building of Deerfield Academy. So this tree has watched Deerfield Academy uh, being built and of course has seen countless teenagers for years and years and years. And one of the more recent teenagers that attended Deerfield Academy is now the King of Jordan. King of Jordan. Moving on. Ooh, now we're up in uh, Plattsburgh, New York, and this was at the time, the former state champion, Eastern Cottonwood. And you can see the dimensions of the tree there. And that's Monica standing next to the tree for scale. Monica, do you have any observations to make about this? The only thing I wanna say is that this tree has quite a large circumference. And this picture of me is Monica Leverett with her at largest ever circumference. <laughs> And I'm going to tell you that I've happily lost 40 pounds and I'm, I'm much sprier now. But in those days, there was a lot more of her to love. <laughs> so moving on. Now, I said former state champion. Oh, my goodness. There's the current state champion, Eastern Cottonwood, with my friend Fred Breglia director of the Landis Arboretum at Esperance, New York. And Fred discovered this tree. And as I, as if I recall correctly, he saw it from his car. I think he and his wife were maybe riding and it was across a field. And I can't even imagine what he was saying as he got closer and closer and closer. I think if it had been me, I would have invented a, a whole spate of new four letter words as I got closer. Um, at any rate, this, you can see this circumference here, I know of no other Northeastern tree as a single trunk that matches this one. So what's amazing is how recently it was discovered. So how was it that we have, we have uh, tree programs uh, for people of us, we get out and look for champion trees and whatnot. Well, they're still hiding out there. And thank you, Fred, for, that great discovery. Any point to make, Monica? Moving on. Now, mm. from the very, very large, let's go to the very, very old. This is a black gum swamp, Nissa sylvatica. The black gum is the oldest hardwood that we have, deciduous hardwood that we have in the Northeast and in probably the whole Eastern United States. Uh, some people think there are trees that are older than that, but usually they make judgments based upon the size and that is not a good uh, measure of it. At any rate, you can see the black gum here and the, the very deep uh, bark. Uh, and one of the reasons, is they, they grow in the Northeast, they grow in wetlands. Uh, and uh, here's the next one. Did you have any other, anything to add to that? No, no, uh, this, is, yeah. this is the slide that I yeah. insisted on putting in though. Yeah, go because ahead. I love the, the way I, I think of these trees as jazzy, what happens with their upper limbs. And Bob can explain, this is a good way, if you're driving along and you see a tree that's so weirdly crooked like that, sticking up and you know there's a swamp there, you probably are looking at a black gum. And Bob and, will tell you why it does that. Well, 
I'll tell you what my friend Tom Wessel said is if I'm hoping I'm uh, remembering correctly, but he said these trees uh, tend to, to, their limbs tend to break in winds aloft. So rather than the whole tree blowing over, it just sheds limbs, grows them back, sheds limbs and grows them back. And this is an example of what you get. You get this uh, ancient look to the, the trees. Now I'm gonna move on and, and show you, the question is, well, okay, I said they're old, how old? This is uh, Dave Orling, uh, my, my friend from Harvard Forest, and he is coring a 555 year old black gum that started growing in 1468 in that swamp. And by the way, one in Concord, uh, in a, a swamp, black gum swamp in Concord, New Hampshire, was cored back in the 1990s by Dan Sperduto of the Natural Heritage Program there, and it was. 670 years old, it's over 700 years old now. And that would be about as old as any hardwood we know of. Um, again, other trees have been thought to be older, particularly live oaks in the Southeast. I've seen ages listed as a thousand or 1500 years, but when we, we ultimately learn they're more like three or 400 years old. Monica, did you have anything to say? Yep. Moving on. Now, let's go back to the very, very tall. We looked at the very, very old. Here's an example of trees as tall as they're going to get in the Northeast. This was the tallest accurately measured tree we know of in the Northeast. But on May 4th, 2017, um, a, a storm hit and it, it topped that tree, which we had named the Longfellow Pine. At the time it broke, it was 184.5 feet in, in height. And by the way, it had been measured for height in, um, it was 1997 at a conference we had at Clarion University, Old Growth Forest Conference, by my great friend Jack Sobin, a timber framer and architect who owned a transit. And he measured that tree for height at that point in time was 179 feet and I think one and a half inches or something like that. So from 1997 to 2017, he went from 179 uh, and, and a, a fraction to 184 and a half. It was growing very slowly, but it had not actually quit growing. We don't really know for sure how old that tree is totally, but at 120 feet where we it, it broke off, we got a counting of 180 years. So it was 180 years old at 120 feet above ground. At, at any rate, there it is. Now, uh, I, I'll, uh, did you have anything to add to that, Monica? Uh, just to note the last sentence in this slide. Longfellow is the only pine in the Northeast modern times to reach a height of 180 feet or more by accurate measurement. Claims of taller pines are just that, claims, claims right? right? Right. Moving on now, I, I wanted to wait for this one. The great caretaker of Cook Forest is my great friend. And there he is, Dale Lutheringer. He is the, the DCNR's um, I think is eco, environmental educational specialist. Uh, specialist. And uh, I've helped him uh, measure virtually every white pine of any size in Cook Forest. But we uh, keep track of those that are especially large, for example, ones with uh, trunk volumes of over a thousand cubic feet. This is one of them. And you can see how much that translates to to tons of carbon in the tree itself. Cook Forest itself has about 2,400, 2,500 acres of old growth forest and a cathedral pine stand of 250 to 350 year old pines. Um, it, it was uh, formerly owned by a timber baron by the name of Anthony Wayne Cook. Uh, I know his uh, grandson quite well, Anthony Eden Cook, who is a noted environmentalist. Now this this place this this forest has special significance to Monica. I would like for her to explain why. Well, this that you can see it in this picture, and if you go to the Cathedral Pines and other parts of Cook Forest, you'll see it even more. All of this wonderful moss. It, this is a real old growth picture. You see uh, the coarse woody degree, debris on the ground. You see a snag. You see an older tree. You see 
uh, 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 younger trees, uh, just just uh, wonderful. It's a magical place. It's in Western Pennsylvania, about how, how far from the Ohio border? About 65 miles or so from the Ohio border. So it's a good hefty drive, but it's well worth uh, visiting this place. And uh, th this is one of the places uh, that I feel if there are elves and fairies and nature spirits, they are living in Cook Forest. They are probably also living in Ice Glen and uh, Mohawk Trail State Forest. Uh, but it's just magical. You, you can almost imagine, think that you're in a fairy tale when you go there. Okay, moving on. Now, back to New England. And this is, at this point in time, the tallest tree we know of in New England. It's in Mohawk Trail State Forest. And Jared Lockwood recently measured it right at 174 feet. Uh, uh, formerly another tree in Mohawk Trail State Forest was 176.2, but has been losing crown. And I, we say this, I normally, uh, in the past, I would talk about the name of the tree. We usually give them names uh, and give exact locations, but they tend to be loved to death. So we, we, we will uh, share with people great walks, but we don't give the exact locations of these pines out. By the way, that's the, whoops, it happened again. Uh, that's the Deerfield River. And uh, I am, again, in Mohawk Trail State Forest. Uh, anything else, Monica? Well, we should look at oh. the view of all 174, well, well, or almost most of the 174 feet. Yes, that's what it looks like from the ground. The, the circumference at Breast Heights, 12.1 feet and in 174 feet in height, it's still putting on growth at between five or six inches a year. Uh, but at, at these great age, greater ages, the trees lose crown, they gain crown, they lose crown, they gain crown, but overall it's averaging about a five or six or seven inch uh, growth per year. Okay, let's see, moving on, this is a little bit of history. Uh, Mohawk Trail State Forest now is, has the tallest pines in New England, but formerly they were here. And this is in Connecticut, Cornwall, Connecticut. These were the famous cathedral pines of Cornwall, Connecticut. And pictures like this taken by my good friend, Jack Sobin, the one who measured uh, with transit, the Longfellow pine, he measured 172 footer in these, this forest, unfortunately, in July 1989, along came a big whoosh wind, and oops, that's what we got on the left-hand side. Fortunately, some of the pines did not blow down, and we still have at least 150 footers, one or two, in, in a spot in the uh, Cathedral Pines at Cornwall. I would point out this is a nature conservancy property, or at least it was. I don't know whether they still own it or not. Nonetheless, after all of that blowdown, there was a big cry, human cry, to salvage log all that, or everything was just going to go up in a conflagration. And TNC stood their ground, thank God for that. And so we now have this living laboratory of how a place like this um, can so can rejuvenate or grow back, and we're seeing that happen all the time. Monica, anything? And just note, it never did burn because these old forests are have a lot of moisture in them. Yeah, They're they do. Less likely to have a fire. Moving on, ah, uh, the incomparable Adirondacks, one of my favorite places on Earth. That is Mount Marcy, the highest peak at 5344. And for those of you who have not been keeping up on the geology, these mounds are not, what well, we once thought they were ancient mounds like the Appalachians, but that's not true. These are young mounds, they are still growing. And they're vast. There's about 6 million acres in the Adirondack Park. And moving on, there's old growth aplenty. Uh, Monica, did you have, well, let, let me say, just say this. This is in packed forest. You're fine. Uh, it's uh, managed by uh, State University of New York, SUNY at, at Syracuse. And these are two of the giant white pines and a somewhat younger Bob with somebody who's measuring gizmos uh, around my waist or around my neck. And packed forest 
survived partly because the owner's wife did not want those trees cut. It was owned by a, a, a lumber company. And oftentimes women have been the saviors of these places. Uh, did you have anything else? Okay, moving on, another great place in the Adirondacks is Halfway Brook. My son Rob, and that's him, discovered this place. And, you know, we're talking about it that I think it was 2016. It might have been 2017, early 2017. But we went there. And it, it, it's, it's as though these places become almost invisible as people whiz by on, on the roads, yet you walk just a few yards off the road in the Adirondacks and you're in pristine forest. The late, great Barbara McMartin did endless research and came up with at least 350,000 acres of primary forest that was never logged, in other words, out of the 6 million acres of the park. And this is part of that in the high peaks uh, wilderness area. Uh, this was not the largest pine in there, by the way. We measured one at 16 feet in circumference. Monica? And I'd just like to note that the Adirondacks 350,000 acres of old growth is the largest amount of old growth anywhere in the East, even more, more than the smoke, Great Smoky Mountains. A lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, the Great Smokies have about 150,000 acres. Now, to give you some perspective, um, a thousand acres is a lot if you're right in the middle of it. The Big Reed Pond in Maine is about 5,000 acres, and that's large for an eastern, uh, an area in east. But the Adirondacks just blow all the other places away. Moving on, uh, I've been showing some big trees, but old growth is also Tolkien esque. This is old growth yellow birch on the top of Plateau Mountain in. Uh, the, the Catskills. And people didn't think there was any old growth left until Michael Kudish, retired professor emeritus from Paul Smith's College, really went and did the research and identified somewhere like 64,000 acres of old growth surviving in the Catskills in New York. But most of it looks like this. It's top of the mountain growing on bedrock. It's beautiful to me. I love this old stuff, gnarly, twisted, surviving, but most people do not recognize it as old growth forest. Monica and I took the, the hike up there and there's a stretch of several thousand acres as you walk along the, the, the summit of uh, Plateau Mountain, looking uh, out into the surrounding high peaks, you see some of that. Moving forward, there is an, uh, an example of the view from Plateau and this is uh, Catterskill High Peak. It, uh, it was once thought to be the highest peak in the Adirondacks at 3,655 feet. The Catskills. The Catskills, I'm sorry. The actual uh, highest mountain is in the Catskills is slide at 4,180 feet. At any rate, I'm in, or we were in old growth at this point, uh, but, but the trees are not large. Moving on. Yep. Now, Switching over to New Hampshire. I wish I had more pictures of New Hampshire, but a computer crash. I lost a lot of my original pictures that I had taken in places like Bradford Pines and whatnot. So this is my entry and I apologize to every one of my friends in New Hampshire. At any rate, this is a new area, relatively new discovery of old growth. And my good friend, Chris Kane, is part of that, and they've they're up to about 350 acres. And this was a yellow birch, and they cored some of them in this general area, and they were in the order of 350 years old. But that's a very large yellow birch, thinking back to the pictures before when you had gnarled, uh, you almost reached to the top of the, the, the those trees. And here's really a, a, a whopper. Uh, anything on that, Mark? Moving on, uh, into Vermont, again, my computer crash robbed me of some excellent pictures there. I did find one here, and that was in Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historic Park. And this is not old growth, but it does grow a tree and it grows them to big size. Here's the, uh, the dimensions on the tree. 
And I just would point out that in, in modeling these trees for volume and whatnot, it would take 11 pines measuring 18 inches DBH with a hundred foot height to match the amount of wood in this one tree. So these large trees are very efficient storied storehouses of carbon. There's, there's an economy of scale that they get more efficient as they get larger. Uh, Just to clarify, DBH is diameter at breast height and he calls himself DBH guru. Humorously, of course. Mo moving on. <laughs> now, going into the next phase of, okay, what am I here for? Let's talk about the carbon a little bit. But before we do that, let's also talk about how we got our data. This, the Jake Swamp Pine, was as of 2018, the tallest accurately measured tree we had in New England. Uh, and we climbed and tape drop measured it four times. We measured from the ground now. I used an impulse laser, 200 LR, accurate to two, plus or minus two centimeters in distance and a tenth of a degree in angle. And this was the a tree that we have babied through the years and, and uh, modeled it. And there is an example of Will Blozan from uh, Black Mountain, North, North Carolina, climbing the tree, taking uh, circum, circumference measurements. Uh, we measured it in, in basically, sorry folks, there it goes again. Uh, 320, th this tree uh, is still uh, sequestering about 320 pounds of carbon dioxide, taking it out of the atmosphere annually. Now, moving on, how, how do we uh, look at a tree like this? That's a picture of it on the left. This slide right here, or this graph right here, shows the accumulation of carbon over time at these points in time. So you can see it's continually going up. I have it projected to 180. It's about 160 now. So that's where we are now. And at these, these are not equal increments of time because these are times when we took measurements for modeling ages. the tree, ages, ages at those times. What does that look like when we look at carbon gained annually? Uh, I apologize, I apologize. Down here on this graph, we have the growth of, of the carbon. Uh, for, this is annually. How, how many pounds of carbon does, was the tree gaining annually at 30 years, at 50 years, at 100 years? It's not a smooth graph because things happen to the trees. They have good years. They have bad years. They have crown breakage. The, the actual computations of how much carbon comes off of a statistical model, and it really doesn't know if the tree got uh, uh, topped. Uh, uh, so so the, the numbers are coming out of that model. This is just a two year span right here, but it reached its absolute maximum annual gain of carbon at 152 years. This really uh, doesn't happen in all of the pines. This is a dominant pine. I don't want to make it sound like every white pine in a stand of white pines that's allowed to grow that long is going to continue to sequester carbon at that rate. But the big ones and the old ones do uh, continue to be productive for a lot longer. Uh, moving on, I'm running uh, uh, okay. quite. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, th this, uh, I, I want to quickly switch and turn it over to Monica because she does such a much better job of explaining this. This is turning to trees art. as objects of art. Monica, take it away. Okay. Uh, we got to know uh, the internationally known fine art photographer, Mitch Epstein, uh, because he has a project now. Uh, it's a years long project of photographing old growth. He's been out to the bristlecone pines and the cypresses in the North Carolina swamps and and in in eastern United States with Bob. And so he's there, Bob has shown him many trees that he's taken pictures of, or perhaps portraits that could be said. Um, and this is one of my favorite yellow birches in Monroe State Forest. Um, and uh, there's something, this this scene uh, incredibly beautifully evokes old growth to me. Uh, the, the feel of it. And of course it is, it's a very 
very old tree. Um, so we're grateful to have gotten to know Mitch and seen his work. Well, moving on, uh, I, we're, we're going to mercifully end to give you a, a break with a picture from Keene Valley in the Adirondacks, looking back into the high peaks and give you a moment of respite before we take any questions or what have you. And we should say that this is at the beginning of the trail the, that goes up Rooster Combe. Rooster Combe Mount, is the, is the uh, destination on this trail. But this is tranquil, beautiful. There it is, folks. And you can just, we can all take a breath and look at it. And I think from that, we should turn it back over to Sophie. To Sophie. Sophie. Hey. Oh, Hello. we have to stop our share. Huh? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Right? Right. Okay. Everyone's saying thank you in the chat. Thanks everyone for being here and listening. What a gorgeous photo at the end. Wow. So in the course of an hour, we've been to Pennsylvania, the Adirondacks, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Vermont. Wow. All over the place. What? a journey in the course of an hour. Um, and we've got, of course, so many questions for you. Uh, for folks in the audience, uh, Bob and Monica are graciously willing to stay on to answer some questions. We can stay on as late as seven o'clock. So we'll see how far we get with your questions. Um, you're welcome to stay on with us, of course. Uh, if you do have to go, we are again recording this. And so you'll get that link from us on Friday. Um, so uh, I'd like to start off with a question that a couple people asked, so I'm just going to kind of consolidate it. Of course, after seeing all these great trees on the screen, people want to go into the forests and get out of them. So like you said, we want to keep uh, some of the big trees and their secret locations protected, but it sounds like you might also have some walks to recommend for people on trails that are out there. What, what kinds of walks are out there for people to check out some old forests? Well, you know, what comes to my mind is maybe Monica and I need to come up with a list uh, that we would then send to you, and maybe you could get that around. Some of the walks yes. we, we were showing, the Bryant Woods is, is a wonderful walk. It's short, uh, but it's very rewarding. Ice Glen has a trail through it. Mohawk Trail State Forest uh, uh, has a the Mohican Mohawk Trail through it. Uh, we could go on and on. There are many places. What I could we could do is come up with a list where we tell you what the trail is, but also identify the salient fe features. Is it a big tree walk? Wow. Is it mainly old growth, but gnarly, and uh, that might not otherwise be recognized? That sort of thing. Would that work? Can we do that, Monica? Yeah, well, we're working on it, but of the project we're working on that's relatively easy for me anyway, is uh, all the places in Massachusetts that you can go, but our audience is from much farther. Um, I think that there's been talk about, uh, Bob has been a co-author of the Sierra Club Guide to Ancient Forests Ancient of the Northeast. Ancient Forests of the Northeast. It's out of print <laughs> and perhaps a little bit out of date too. Um, so that book uh, is, is- It gives a lot of walks. Yeah, but we want to sort of make a new version of it. Right. And we'll do the Massachusetts section and we'll rely on people from the other states to supply their things. So maybe there will be something like that. Uh, possibly the Massachusetts thing might happen in a, well, in a month or two. Yeah, that's a big thing, but I was just thinking in terms of a list. Oh, just make a list. Yeah, yeah, with, with one or two sentences on what. Okay. Let's, we'll, yeah, we can definitely that. share that with folks in the email. And I see people chiming in in the chat that they would love that. So that's super generous of you. I also saw um, that Joan Maloof, who you mentioned in your presentation, is in the audience tonight. Hi, Joan. Yay, um, Joan. And, she, and if you visit the Old Growth Forest Network's website, they, those are all publicly accessible for us. And some of the ones you mentioned tonight are in the old growth forest network. So that's another way to find some old forests um, and forests that are growing older that um, are accessible. 
And other folks you mentioned from the presentation uh, are also in the audience, Susan Messino and Jared Lockwood. Um, so just wanted to give a, out a shout to those cameos. <laughs> Thank you. So it Jim. sounds like you have another book in the works. Do you, um, are there any other books that you've authored or co-authored? Well, I've co-authored uh, Eastern Old Growth Forest Prospects for re recover, Rediscovery and, and Recovery. And I, I have a number of other books that I am in, usually as a chapter or whatever, uh, but uh, I usually co-authoring just a part. Right. We did, we gave you a, a book list, I think, to send to people. Yes. We did not include your books. Maybe we should revise oh, it. I, for, I forgot my books. I <laughs> forgot his books. Senior okay, we'll add, we'll add those in there. Yeah, so folks on this call, you're going to have a lot of great resources in that email as well to continue to stoke, stoke your enthusiasm. Um, so, with identifying old growth forest, um, I know you've got that list that we'll be sharing with everybody. Um, someone has been, Megan is wondering, is there any way for a particular tree at a glance to assess whether it's an old growth tree or not? Well, yes, because trees like people change their appearance. This is no longer the body of a 20 year old. I think we all would recognize that. What are the characteristics that go with a species? I can take someone out in for a walk and point out the change of characteristics. And that's what I frequently do. We go and we take, okay, here's a sugar maple. This is what they look like when they're really young. Of course, they're gonna be small then, but as they go grow larger, Here's what they, they look like, what the bark looks like. Uh, they go from often symmetrical to asymmetrical, the limbs thicken. I can point all these out. It works a lot better out in the field on mm. walks, but there are uh, descriptions that we, we could have. Um, actually photographs help too, but you really need uh, a, a collage, so to speak. You need to see the younger forms and as they go forward, but it's so much easier to do that out in the field. Nonetheless, yes, you can tell old trees from young trees. The one thing that sometimes gets confusing is if you get a tree that's aged prematurely, let's say one that's in a wetland, oftentimes they can be mm -hmm. mistaken by characteristics for being old when they're not really that old. Oh, I did not know that. I knew about how you could have some really old trees that still look small, but I didn't know you could have old trees in disguise that aren't really. There will, um, still, give, there will still be indicators that they're not that old, but they still will superficially, if you, if you took a list of characteristics, written characteristics, and said, oh, it matches this one, this one, oh, this one, you, you might say, oh, well, that's an old growth specimen based upon the characteristics when it isn't. Well, I um, think it's not an old growth specimen unless it's in an old growth forest. I think it's an old tree, but that's yeah. my my use of language yeah yeah that we, we've probably we, we never really meant old growth to apply to individual trees we've really mm. applied to the ecosystem as a whole but it's used commonly in our old growth trees so we mean old tree yeah wherever it's right. growing <laughs> and if somebody comes across what they believe to be an old growth patch of forest or a really old tree that may possibly be a contender for a champion tree? Where can people report those potential places and trees? Well, here, here are two, two answers. First of all, if it's, if it's a forest, maybe the, the, the local natural heritage program of the state, uh, if, the, if it's on a property such as uh, Northeast Wilderness Trust, then <laughs> you go to the, obviously you go to the landowner. Uh, if you're talking about an individual tree there, and you're talking about, is it really that old? Well, then you've got to get someone who's a real expert at dating trees. And, and that can usually, again, be done through a program, natural heritage program or whatnot. If it's large, and you think, oh, this is a champion, then each state has a program for champion trees, champion tree program. New Hampshire has a, 
a great one. Vermont's got a good one. Uh, Maine's got one. Massachusetts got one. Uh, the national one, American Forest, I've uh, been a, a big part of, uh, and that's for national champions. But you can go out and Google, for example, champion trees of New Hampshire or something like that, and you'll get the program and then contact them. Great. Thank you. Maybe we'll see some more of those reports flowing in after this presentation. And so talk is in terms of measuring those individual trees, I'm going to lob a couple questions at you um, for the sake of time about those measurements. So we've got folks curious about you talked about um, trees scored with points. Right. So how how do you score a tree with points? What do the points mean? Oh, OK, this this came from American Forest and the National Champion Tree Program that started back in 1940. And uh, actually, a, for, a Maryland forester was the origin of it in around 1926. And he was afraid that all of the really good genetic material was going to be lost in, in, in clearing the land. And so he, he wanted to call attention to really big trees as genetic repositories. Uh, but how do you judge trees? So it evolved that you take the measurement of the circumference at breast height in inches. You take the height, total height in feet, and you try to figure out an average crown spread in feet and take one fourth of that and add those three numbers together. Those are the points. And that's the point total in whichever tree has the most points. Well, that's the champ. Cool, I like it. That's uh, registers with me a little bit more than basketball points. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when you're coring a tree out in the field to determine an age, does that hurt the tree? Well, I don't core trees anymore. I turn to really professionals like my friends at Harvard Forest. They take an increment bore and they extract a fine core. Now, these trees are a little more hardy than you might otherwise give them credit for. They get broken limbs. So a fine core taken out of the tree is typically not something that is, is bad unless the tree is really uh, susceptible to decay. So coring, for example, a red maple is a little risky. Coring a white mm -hmm. oak, no risk at all. Uh, what they will do is they will take a fine core uh, using an increment board, then they'll take it back to a laboratory, they'll sand it and stain it, and then they'll look at, at it under a dissecting microscope. It becomes very uh, careful. Uh, if, if the tree is um, fast grown and let's say a white pine, you, you can pretty well date it out in the field by eye count. But to be, you don't count a 555 year old black gum out in the field. That has to be done in the laboratory. Right. And with uh, measuring trees, um, Nicole has heard um, this, this quick way of measuring the diameter of tree using a coin while standing back. Have you heard of this method and do you know anything about it? Well, that, that would simply be a, an example of using the method of similar triangles, whether it's a coin or a yardstick or a foot ruler or something else. You can, in fact, if you know the length from your eye to the object, its width, and you fade back far enough that you just mask the trunk of the tree and you know the distance to the trunk of the tree through simple algebra, you can calculate the approximate width uh, of the tree. Height. Uh, oh, were we talking about the trunk width or were we talking about height? Um, let's see, this person, thought that they had heard it in terms of diameter, but maybe- yeah, that's, what I, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm okay. talking about. So the diameter of the tree. So it really devolves to an application of the principle of similar triangles. Okay. You, can, you can use a penny, but you just have to know the width of the object that you're going to use to mask the trunk diameter okay. at the distance and in the, in the distance to the trunk and the distance from your eye to the object that you're holding to mask. It's, it's, is, pretty simple. it's pretty simple uh, and you can do it in, in with, uh, um, there are shortcuts to that that I can teach people how to do. How accurate. That is very cool. 
it's not bad. It, it's it's not going to be the most accurate way you do it, but it'll certainly get you into the ballpark. Yeah, a good good at home estimate. Maybe not for the research grade papers. No, no, not for that. <laughs> um. So uh, Joan Pierce is wondering about in the Mohawk State Forest, which you talked about in this presentation. Uh, so Joan's asking about those, I, I think those same trees you were talking about, um, what, their, what their approximate ages are. Oh, uh, I'm trying okay. to know which trees I showed. In the Mohawk Trail State Forest? Mm -hmm. Well, Mohawk I, State first, Forest in mass. Picture, yeah, the first picture was on a boulder field. And in the center of the picture was a sugar maple that we think is somewhere between 200 and 250 years old. Uh, the, the yellow birch, candelabra yellow birch is probably pushing 300. It was on the more toward the right hand side uh, of the photograph. Other trees in there were, were much younger. Uh, the, the boulder field there, when Tony D'Amato cored the, the black birch, Betula lenta at 332 years. It was a very small tree. Uh, they grow very, very slowly. They're nutrient uh, 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 deprived because they're growing on bedrock. Uh, so they can get to great ages and still stay very small sizes. There are many of the trees in Mohawk Trail State Forest that are 200 to 300, 350 years old. The oldest one that Tony dated himself was uh, in Coal River A area of Mohawk Trail State Forest at the time, 2005, when he dated, he was 488 years old. So it's now over 500 years hemlock. old. And it was on Eastern Hemlock. Wow. But how old are the champion, the tall pines that you showed? The, Paul, the tall <laughs> pines are generally on the age of 150, 160 years. Both uh, the, the tall pines that were in, uh, not, not in Cook Forest, those are much older. But in Mohawk Trail State mm -hmm. Forest, the tall pines and in in uh, and in Bryant are on the order of one forty to one sixty. Amazing, thank you. And uh, Billy is wondering if you know how old um, eastern red cedar can get. Oh, very very old. Uh, we have dated them on the banks of the Mississippi River, or or the, was it yeah Mississippi River in, in a, a dolomite formations to over 900 years in age. So Easter red wow. seed can go up to that age. They don't do it in all, all different rock types. So dolomite formation is where they get that. Uh, but northern, uh, northern white cedar has been dated to 1,500 years old. And uh, the oldest dated tree we know of in the Eastern United States is dated by Dave Staley from the Tree Ring Laboratory at the University of Arkansas, the Black River Swamp in North Carolina at 2,624 years of old. Wow. Bald cypress. A bald cypress over 2,000 years old. Down, hands down, the bald cypress is the oldest Eastern species and about the fifth or sixth oldest on the planet that we know of. Wow, that's amazing. So we spent a lot of this presentation above ground and you did also mention what's happening below ground. Johnny's wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how a forest matures underground. Well, I'm not an expert in that. I can say that uh, Sudan Samari opened her eyes to the underground networks. But for a, a, a long time, ecologists have understood that underground fungi become the kings. They are very important and they link one tree to another through a, a particular kind of fungi called mycorrhizae. And as a consequence, they pass nutrients. Uh, the, the, the tree gets nutrients, the fungi gets nutrients, but they pass it from tree to tree. So uh, in a community sense, uh, it's, it's like, um, what was it? Uh, who was it? Uh, Hillary Clinton wrote that book about it takes a community. Takes well, a it, it, it takes a village, whatever. Well, underground, that's what happens in these forests. So that a weak tree will actually often be given nutrients from surrounding larger, older trees, such as mother trees, as 
referenced by Suzanne Samard. Monica, did you have something? Yeah, I'll add that in our book list, we'll have Suzanne Samard's book recommended called Finding the Mother Tree. And the term that a lot of people have come to use about this underground system is wood wide web. And, and by the way, that, that kind of community, uh, it, it doesn't survive in old fields. Uh, or, or forests that have been uh, excessively cut and dried out. This, these, these really old underground networks uh, take a long time to develop, but once they're there, they persist, and that's the, the, the amount of life and, and processes going on below ground are arguably more important than above ground. And it seems like so much more that we have yet to learn and understand. Another, yet another reason to protect wild places and old yeah. forests. Yes. And as you and many of our audience members tonight know, the places that Northeast Wilderness Trust protects, uh, we like to call them the um, uh, ancient forests of the future or the old growth of tomorrow. And we've got a question from Peter about if there are any significant differences, say, you know, hundreds of years from now, a forest that Newt protects has reached that older complex structure. Are there any significant differences between a forest like that that has had a history of cutting or logging and has become an old forest again versus an old growth forest that has never in its entire history uh, been cut? I'm really, that's a, 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 an excellent question. I wish I could give a, a, an authoritative, authoritative answer. I would simply say that the forest that has been left alone probably has life forms and processes that wouldn't be easily matched uh, for literally hundreds of years, but eventually I would have to guess that the, the forest uh, uh, starting out uh, would get there. When we think of it, you know, once upon a time in the Northeast, uh, we had ice, <laughs> we had glaciers, we didn't have any forest. So everything came back from some point in time, uh, but, but it isn't a hundred years. Right, yeah, so we're talking multiple centuries and that's a great point of, of we haven't, because all of that clearing in the Northeast happened within just 200 or so years ago, um, we, I guess we'll find out. Yes. Um, well, maybe not me. I probably won't be around for that. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody will find out. Um, great. And then, um, we've, okay, I think we've got time for one or two more questions. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you've been helping out Northeast Wilderness Trust with our wildlands ecology program. So Bob's been teaching our wildlands ecologist Shelby Perry um, some of your um, special methods for measuring trees, especially for extrapolating the amount of carbon in those trees. And Northeast Wilderness Trust is putting that into practice um, in some exciting research that. Uh, are, we've just started and are getting off the ground. Um, and I'm wondering if you could go into detail. Uh, John Adams has this question about measuring the amount of carbon in a tree. Could you tell us a little bit more about that process? In, in, in relatively few words, I have to, first of all, I have to take the species and its density. So density figures in here, the density of the wood, the density of the bark. And we know if we kill and dry the wood in the bark, we know the uh, dry weight, which is pure uh, organic material, no water. So we have to know that. We start out and we measure the volume and, and the volume is complex to do, to do the whole tree. So we often have statistical models that we can feed in the, the circumference uh, or diameter at breast height and the total height or whatever, and maybe some other variables, and it spits out a volume. We, we take, the, and it may be just the volume of the trunk. We may have to, to have apply other factors to get the volume of the branches and add all that together. Ultimately, we start out with volume, and then we, uh, we end up from the, the total volume applying the density 
and we come out with biomass, total biomass, and that's dry biomass, wood and bark. Then we take the proper percentage of that that represents elemental carbon. For example, in a white pine, it'd be 52.1%. Uh, most of the hardwoods are a little below 50%, 49, 48 and a half, something like that. But we would simply apply to the total dry weight, the, the proper percentage, and that would be the carbon. That would be the amount of carbon we have. Now, if we want to convert that to carbon dioxide equivalent, in other words, how much CO2 had to be absorbed out of the atmosphere to deposit that much carbon into the trunk or, or into, into the tree, because that's what, all of the carbon that goes into the tree comes out of the atmosphere. It doesn't come from other sources. Then we would multiply uh, the carbon by 3.664, and that would give us the total uh, weight or, or mass of the carbon equivalent carbon dioxide that would come out of the air. We do that sort of thing all the time. And basically what I uh, hope to do to help Shelby with is to come up with models that she can apply. She goes out, let's say, and she measures the, the diameter of a tree and its height, and then she plugs those numbers into a model for that particular species and comes out with everything she needs. She comes out with the volume, she comes out with the carbon, she comes out with the carbon dioxide, et cetera, et cetera. It's very labor intensive to develop those models. So uh, we, ha we have a, uh, uh, an agreement. Uh, Shelby's going to bake us some pies. Ah. Get down the next time she comes, uh, an apple pie or a cherry pie, or she can bring down a, a blueberry pie. <laughs> and she's going to pay. <laughs> Sorry, Shelby, I had to get that one in. <laughs> well, I know she's in the audience tonight, so now we know the 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 pie ratio to to labor cost of creating a pie. carbon modeler. <laughs> oh, and uh, my colleague Nadine is chiming in that uh, each one of us at Newt will make you some pies. So I think <laughs> I think you'll be all set on dessert for the next couple of years. <laughs> Oh, by the way, to use a Carol, a Carol Burnett uh, uh, saying, pi, somebody said, well, pi are square. It was on pi day. And she said, no, pi are not square. Pi are round. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that didn't come that's that pretty good. Burnett, So if it sounds really corny, that's <laughs> blame her. <laughs> I like that one. That's great. Oh, let's see if we can. Sneak in one more, it's 656. Um, let's see, um, do you know if any state agencies have completed inventories of old growth and mature forest stands on publicly owned lands? Well, I, I'm, I'm a little behind on that, but my guess is that the natural heritage programs uh, of uh, at least uh, Maine and probably New Hampshire and Vermont uh, ha have probably done that. There have been various uh, surveys, sometimes coming out of academic uh, institutions and whatnot. So we have all kinds of figures. Uh, back in the early 1990s, uh, great colleague, Dr. Mary Bird Davis put together a listing. She went out to every agency public, uh, private, and whatnot, and put uh, in, uh, she came out with an inventory of old growth in the East, an inventory. And that was a starting, I was part of that. I was part of that for Massachusetts and, and elsewhere, went a lot of places, including that around the Smokies. And that was a pretty good accounting, but we found a lot more since then. And I think that uh, that needs to be done again in some form and hopefully on no uh i'm sorry september 21st to the 23rd we'll have uh, an old growth forest conference in new hampshire uh, chris kane david govatsky and others uh, i'm one of the planners of that and and we're kind of hoping that something like that would come forward that we would be able to identify sources where somebody could go out and say, okay, these are the old growth forests that we now know about that we didn't know about then. That would be great. And someone put a link to that conference 
um, in the chat for folks who are interested. Um, well, I'll close us out with a question from Kate, who would love to hear about for each of you, where did your love for old growth forests come from? Well, Monica, you want to start? <laughs> no, I want you to start. Uh, I've not ever not been in love with old growth forests. I, I just didn't know what they were. I, I grew up, you know, in the Southern Appalachians in the uh, shadows of the Great Smoky Mountains and loved those kinds of forests. And later on learned that they were then called virgin. And uh, they, so nature has always been an underpinning of everything that I've ever done. So it's not like I came to discover them in, in some uh, urban to rural fashion. They were, they were always part of my life. And what happened was that when I started recognizing in Massachusetts, when I retired from the US Air Force and settled in Massachusetts, I started recognizing places that looked like the Smoky Mountain old growth and started uh, developing associations with people in the state and whatnot. And it grew, um, I became known as Jubilation T. Pinecone, the big tree dude, all different kinds of titles are, but it all sprang from that love of the, the forest. Now, Monica's story comes. Well, my story is different because um, I always loved being in nature and in the woods, uh, but I had no idea, uh, no sense of this is a quality forest. This is an old growth forest. This is a, a, a what do they call that? The, when they take the best and leave the rest. High graded. High graded forest. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. Um, and, uh, but that didn't last long because <laughs> with him, uh, and so you really introduced me to old growth, I would say, and it's just so magical. And so to, to be in touch with time in, in a different way in those forests, the, the, the processes that have gone on for so long, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's amazing. So, but I owe it to him. So. Well, if, if I may digress just a little while, on our first date, I took her to Mohawk Trail State Forest and I was in my professorial mode and talking about the trees and the processes and whatnot. But I mean, my mouth was going a mile a minute. And this was our first date. And a little bird came and sat on my shoulder and said, hey, schmuck, you're going to blow this if you don't shut up. Let her enjoy it on her own. So I, I've learned a lot from Monica on how to, uh, to, to, to be quiet and, and love old growth. <laughs> 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 <Christmas>. <laughs> well, 